So, hello, I am Joanne Gear. I am the executive director for the Westchester Biotech Project. And today you are in a session of our consortium on translational research in the microbiome with a focus on advancing microbiome science to clinical practice. And today we're going to hear from Dr. Jumin Lee who on uh, gut, the gut microbiome and food allergy. Westchester Biotech Project launched in 2017. We're coming up on four years. And really from the beginning, our intention is to focus on bringing together researchers, data scientists, and engineers across all different aspects of biomedical research from discovery to preclinical to clinical to patient care to population health. Uh, we could not do this on our own. We work with lots of different organizations. You're going to be learning about ILSA in a moment. We have partnerships with Montero Language Services, uh, which is a translation and localization company based in Madrid. Uh, we've worked with Skanska and Biomed Realty, which owns about half of Kendall Square in Boston, JP Morgan, and so on. Uh, it's really been a wonderful uh, process of making all these great friends. Uh, the two sort of big banners that we work with are our career consortium, which is all about anything to do with training, career development, uh, a, a major focus on young investigators, the sort of age 25 to 40, you know, you're getting your PhD and you're building your life. And that's a really tender time in a scientist's life. If we can people, people on the bench, we like to do that. And then we also partner with colleges and pre-college programs to support the pipeline in general. And uh, our data hub, the Westchester Data Analytics Hub is launching this year. And it's really about bringing together data scientists across all those different silos. We're starting with population health because we have the right partner, uh, Paul Savage uh, from Healthcare Intelligence. And, uh, we are working with access to 700 million healthcare records, some of them going back longitudinally for 20 years um, through uh, a registered researcher at, with New York State uh, Department of Health. And uh, beginning with uh, access to the database, but also training for managers in how to work with data scientists and vice versa. Um, as well as some internships and so on. So there'll be more of that coming, but we're very uh, happy to share that news. I wanna introduce Keith Bastian, who's the chair of our consortium. Keith. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, and I will take just a moment to introduce uh, the Institute for Life Science Entrepreneurship. Many of you are repeat attendees to this meeting, so I'll try not to go too deep and uh, uh, take too much time, but, uh, the Institute for Life Science Entrepreneurship is a nonprofit uh, research driven organization. We're based on the campus uh, at Kane University. We're in Union, uh, New Jersey, and very close to Newark Airport. And the mission is really um, threefold. One, uh, we're here to promote uh, the entrepreneurship ecosystem and the life sciences in the New York, New Jersey metro region. Uh, we do that through a variety of uh, offerings, um, workshops like this one, which we help run and sponsor. Uh, we formed the New Jersey Academic Drug Discovery Symposium, which is a collection of all the research universities within New Jersey that are have uh, faculty research and interest in uh, drug discovery. And we, w when we were an in-person entity, uh, pre-pandemic, we hosted and sponsored a lot of meetings, which is how we got involved with the Westchester Biotech Project on this particular consortium, uh, which was started probably around 2016, uh, although I could be off plus or minus two years. Um, so that's kind of our outreach mission. Uh, we're also um, an accelerator and an incubator of companies. Um, we have a about 8,000 square feet of lab space, eight or 10 companies, depending upon the month, that are incubating within the space in labs or in office space, uh, companies across the map in different uh, life science uh, enterprises. 
<clears throat> and we work with a much broader number of companies, probably 30 or 40 that are clients, but not uh, uh, physically within our incubator uh, that we help uh, grow and develop and, and nurture the entrepreneurs. Uh, and on the books uh, is a plan to start offering um, formal programs uh, like eLabs uh, for New Jersey based entrepreneurs uh, to gain them skill sets to get companies started and write grants and so forth. But then finally, and I think what connects best with this meeting is uh, we're a research institute as well. I believe from the beginning that to really help promote and uh, advance other entrepreneurs in the sciences, and particularly, particularly early stage, we have to be practicing scientists as well. So our background is in microbiology. The first center, the first researcher center that we created was the Center for Translational Microbiology. And this was done as a 10 year collaboration with the American Type Culture Collection. And they provided very wonderful funding to support research that's allowed us to collaborate and obtain grants and start companies in the microbiology space. And microbiome was a big component of that. Some of our early work was to work with ATCC in developing their microbiome standards, which hopefully those of you that do basic research in microbiome are using them as standards for your research. Um, <clears throat> but more recently, we've started a, a center for uh, translational science in uh, neuroscience. And uh, we're just getting that off the ground. We've had a couple of nice um, kickoff meetings with uh, neuroscience uh, entrepreneurs and faculty members at the different universities in the area. And we've just initiated some research programs and collaborations with uh, neuroscience companies. And part of the rationale for going into that space is the very, very clear and important uh, relationship between microbiome and the gut brain axis and the connection through the immune system to um, a lot of neuro neurodegenerative diseases. So <clears throat> it's a very ripe area for getting uh, grant funding, federal funding. I think that the departure of uh, big pharma from this space, similar to what ha has happened in the uh, antibiotic infectious disease space, provides an opening for us to really help work with entrepreneurs to promote new companies in this space. So my, the microbiome is important. Uh, we've been involved in that area experimentally and in terms of our entrepreneurship building for quite a number of years now. and. Uh, are here and available for people that want the kind of support and offerings that we can provide. And you can go to our website, uh, ilcbio.com and learn a little more information there. Just, uh, you know, give me a call or an email and be happy to put you in touch with the right people here so that we can, uh, you know, explore, uh, you know, collaboration opportunities and opportunities where we might be able to help you. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Keith. Uh, and uh, I always appreciate uh, how much you're doing and uh, it's a great, uh, great platform. Um, we're going to introduce Zhumin Lee. And while you get uh, ready to share your slides, I'm going to just share a little bit about our process. Um, we will listen to uh, Zhumin's presentation and then we will hear from Adela Bonnieu and Richard Theron, who will are uh, going to be sort of our initial discussions. They'll ask some questions and share their perspectives on the scientific and regulatory uh, expertise that they bring to the table. And then I will literally call on different people on the, on the call uh, and invite you to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about what you do and ask any questions or make any comments that you like. So looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks. Joanne, for inviting me to give this uh, talk, it is a great honor. Uh, my topic today is a reset gut microbiome for induction of tolerance in food allergy with natural nano medicine. So the, re the data I'm going to present uh, are mainly from a research setting. In addition to my academic effort, I also take uh, some leadership 
and uh, formed a startup biotech uh, uh, small business uh, company with a goal to link the laboratory discoveries to the real world. Um, so I, this is my disclosure. Uh, I received a sub award as a sub award PI of NIH small business grant with GNT. I share some, um, I am a, um, a primary inventors on several patents. I also listed uh, some activities uh, in this uh, slide. Our research has uh, folks has been uh, focusing on food allergy because food allergy is a very uh, important health problem. It affects 30 million Americans uh, with the annual cost about $25 billion. Um, each year, more than 200,000 ER visits related to young children um, following accidental food exposure. So far, only one FDA approved treatment, uh, which is a powder of peanut, peanuts. This treatment uh, is an um, important milestone, but uh, the treatment is far from satisfactory. Therefore, avoidance and the use of rescue medication for anaphylaxis following accidental exposure is still a main treatment. <clears throat> Fortunately, there are some new treatments uh, and uh, uh, investigation, including other allergen-specific immunotherapy, such as sublingual immunotherapy and the bare skin uh, immunotherapy, some biologicals such as anti-IgE ther therapy and Chinese herbal medicine. Here you can see food allergy pre prevalence uh, increased uh, dramatically in the past uh, 10 to uh, 15 years. Uh, FDA has uh, identified eight foods uh, as uh, major uh, food allergens uh, that uh, cause uh, nearly 98, 95% of uh, food reactions, uh, including uh, peanut, which cause most uh, severe uh, reactions. This slide highlights uh, our understanding of mechanisms of food allergy. As you know, majority of us can enjoy food, but about 10 to 15 percent of Americans will have reactions after they eat some food. Uh, this is because uh, both environmental and the genetic factors, taking peanut as an example, uh, in the genetic susceptible individual exposed to peanut will induce a TH2 bias uh, immune response. This TH2 response will initiate the cascade of food here we talk about the peanut synthesization. Uh, they re promote a B cell to produce IgE that activate a particular effector cells called the mast cells. When the individual eat relevant foods, uh, will trigger mast cell activation and the consequent histamine release that will cause clinical reactions. The clinical symptoms uh, uh, vary uh, depending how much the offending food you ingested and also depends on how sensitive you are. Most of the time you see hives or GI symptoms. Sometimes you even see running nose like crazy. In um, severe cases when the reaction progress, uh, Someone will start to experience uh, uh, respiratory symptoms uh, and uh, circulation problems. This is uh, very dangerous uh, called anaphylactic shock. 
this slide is just to show you the example of a hives that can be, you know, mild version, and a very diffused version, and uh, sometimes you will see the lips and the whole face swelling. In addition to immunological changes, uh, recent study have pointed to the association between gut microbiome and the food allergy. And the research believe that uh, the gut microbiome is associated uh, with the induction of food tolerance and this uh, biosis uh, is associated with food allergy. The regulatory mechanisms of gut microbiota for food tolerance include some factors uh, like bacteria digestive products, including short chain fatty acid, such as butyrate, and the induction of beneficial dendritic cells that stimulate T regulatory cells and promote. Uh, uh, beneficial cytokines like our 10 interferon gamma and the reduce gut inflammation. This is slide that highlight the beneficial factors on the bottom and the risk factors uh, <coughs> related to uh, the development allergy relevant to microbiome. You see on the top, the risk factors, including single child, C-section, and the junk food, the processed food, um, antibiotic use that uh, will impact the development of a healthy and the balanced microbiome. On the other hand, the beneficial factors, including uh, having lots of pets and um, uh, more children in the family eat uh, healthy foods uh, such as vegetables, fruits uh, for baby, you know, have a breastfeeding, of course, uh, introduce probiotics and uh, um, have a farming lifestyle that will create a beneficial uh, gut microbiome. Scientists also provide more detailed information about what bacteria will be beneficial, what will be, <clears throat> uh, will be a, a, a risk factor, and identified that bacteroides family is associated with reduced synthesization in food allergy and in the animal study. Uh, uh, experiments showing that uh, transfer, transferrin bacteri bacteroides clostridia consortium uh, can protect mice from food allergy. Interestingly, there are some ongoing clinical study by phaco transplant uh, <clears throat> products for uh, treating food allergy and the artificial um, a fecal uh, transplant product. Our research is to adapt thousand years of knowledge and experience and uh, um, recent decades of integrative medicine research to develop evidence-based uh, um, uh, intervention for treating food uh, allergy. We are particularly interested in a group of uh, TCM formulation that in, uh, traditionally to treat a parasite infection because parasite infection has uh, also caused a high IgE mass cell activation. So, um, uh, they have a similarity to food allergy. We particularly focus on a formula named the Wume one that used to treat a parasite, gut, par par intestinal parasite, uh, and a chronic diarrhea. From there, we developed the food allergy herbal formula two containing nine individual herbs. We show the evidence of safety and the FC murine model. So we filed the FDA. Um, IND52 is the first FDA um, botanical investigational new drug for food allergy. We completed uh, several trials and uh, showing that uh, FIV2 is uh, safe and uh, immu has immunomodulatory effects. 
we also further developed the refined product that reduce the daily dose and um, concentrate uh, effective ingredients. So we named the EB52 currently in phase two clinical trial. So in addition to continue the formulation, uh, we uh, uh, continue to advance our research by identification and uh, isolation purification of active compounds. We found uh, active compounds, which is a major compound from the formula EB52, um, named uh, borborin. Borborin itself is not a normal, not, not a novel, because this compound has been uh, showing to have uh, other effect. For example, to reduce, uh, to have an effect on metabolic disease. What is new is that we found that this compound has a potent. Uh, uh, effect on IgE production, we showed that um, berberine at a very low dose uh, can almost eliminate uh, IgE pro production by human peripheral blood mononuclear cells. To further advance this uh, compound, we generated a nano medicine to increase uh, oral bioavailability. We found that uh, in the blood use nanomedicine, uh, we see an increase of concentration by two and a half uh, fold. And in the liver, we see 10 times increase. You can see this green peak versus uh, 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 the naked uh, the compound. Importantly, we see the nanomedicine increase the safety profile as shown here. We fed mice with 14 times daily dose did not cause any abnormality on the liver kidney function. As we said in the food allergy research, we use IgE. Uh, you know this uh, critical antibody that uh, cause uh, allergy sensitization as well as uh, histamine as a biomarker. Um, the, the, our next uh, step, it, we want to ask uh, whether this nanomedicine has effect uh, on IgE production. We use the three phases, pre-treatment, uh, we make the mice to, uh, to be allergic to peanut, uh, you can see they have an induction of a peanut specific IgE. And uh, here is a treatment phase, uh, total four weeks. Uh, we have a treated group, which is nanomedicine, showing in the yellow orange uh, on the lower line. We have a control. The red line is a peanut allergic mice without treatment. The blue line is the compound alone. You can see that uh, during the treat, treat mental phase, we see the sharp and the quick reduction of IgE. Uh, very impressively, we found that even the treatment stopped. Uh, we moved to the post-therapy phase. We see IgE continue to reduce and approach it to baseline, and then they remain to be a surprise. Uh, then we look at uh, the clinical protection by uh, uh, evaluate uh, the reactions. Uh, here we use uh, symptom scores uh, ranging from zero, no reaction, uh, four to five is uh, fatal or near fatal reactions. So we see that uh, in red circle, which is the peanut allergic mice without treatment, you see after peanut challenge, they have two to three symptom scores. Uh, as well as uh, other controls. Interestingly, in the nano medicine treated group, we see zero reactions. Um, we also look at the plasma histamine, that's uh, another biomarker. We found that uh, the plasma histamine levels um, in the green line, which indicate uh, the nano medicine treated group, showing almost uh, as normal as the normal controls uh, as compared with peanut 
allergic mice without treatment. This data suggests that this nanomedicine uh, induced a full protection from anaphylaxis in peanut allergic mice. So in addition to immunological mechanisms, next we want to understand whether oral nanoburin medicine can modulate gut microbiome. First, we look at the phylum level, showing in figure A, the top bar shows the normal mice. You can see the blue, blue portion is bacteroides and then the pink is from cutis. This is the composition of normal mice. Now you see the P and A indicates penallergic mice. You see the composition change that they have less bacteroides, but the increase from cutis. Then in the nanotreated mice, we see the increase of bacteroides. They get back restored and then also show the diversity of other bacteria. We then compare the ratio of formocutes and the bacteroides. In the nano group, we see the reduction of this ratio, uh, similar as uh, normal controls. Just want to point that for uh, bacteroides has been shown to be beneficial in other conditions uh, like, a met uh, like a, a metabolic condition. Study also showing that uh, lower bacteroides to form acutis ratio is associated with autism, with the gastro gastric disorders. So, then we take a next level to see whether this uh, bacteria changes has um, uh, any uh, 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 meaningful consequence in food allergy. We look at the correlation between the bacteria and, uh, uh, and the peanut tolerance on the left and the reactions uh, to uh, on the right. You see that the uh, formocutes in pink is associated with the reaction to peanut, whereas uh, bacteroides and other bacteria are uh, associated with the tolerance. The figure, the panel B and the C just give us a, a detailed evaluation. We see here the green and the yellow, um, uh, the nanotreated group and the normal controls, so you, uh, and you see Overall, there is a positive correlation to uh, formocutes and the negative correlation to bacteroides, meaning that uh, uh, more bacteroides will have a protection and uh, more formocutes will, will have a more peanut synthesization. Then we went on to look at uh, uh, deeper uh, analysis and look at the gut uh, microbiome at the genus level. This is a heat map. We do see a good uh, separation of uh, clusters between uh, peanut allergic mice treated and the normal controls. Here we also did uh, a correlation study of uh, uh, genus level of bacteria correlation with uh, histamine on the left, uh, showing the tolerance on the right, uh, showing the, the reactions. You see consistently from acuities is associated with a higher level of histamine and this blue bars is bacteroides associated with less histamine. Interestingly, at the, at the genus level, you also see some from acuities members that also belong to the beneficial bacteria. The same, the same pattern was has been observed in peanut specific IgE from acuities, uh, uh, genus level of bacteria uh, associated with a uh, higher level of IgE, whereas uh, bacteroides uh, associated with less peanut IgE. However, we do see a very interesting observation um, uh, about uh, other family, uh, another uh, member of a from acuities. Taking further analysis, uh, we look at uh, the abundance among the groups uh, 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 between these uh, 
uh, positive or negative or correlated genus bacteria, we see that uh, the nano boborin treated group showed the up regulation of showed the increased uh, abundance of, of bacteria of uh, bacteroides and as uh, shown in C, you can see this one is uh, related to formacutes also up regulated. So therefore, uh, the the bacteria profiles uh, uh, at a phylum level. Uh, uh, is not a conclusive. Once you go a uh, lower level, you will find a more detailed the information may be more meaningful. To give a quick summary, we found a small molecule compound, uh, uh, boberin isolated from uh, TCM, natural medicine, has a potent IgE inhibitory effect. Oral uh, nanomedicine increases uh, bioviability. Uh, to rapid and uh, persistent protection against the peanut allergy immune model. And that this tolerance is associated with the restoration of a healthy gut microbiome uh, profile. Moving forward, we will continue our SBIR supported project uh, by further determining the nanomedicine on gut microbiome associated with T cell, B cell, a tolerance in food allergy will also identify the functional role of uh, the uh, bacteria and will further advance the production for clinical use, uh, prepare for IND application uh, to conduct the safety PK study and the biomarker study in peanut allergic uh, uh, subject and perhaps other food allergy we are seeking for collaborations uh, uh, with uh, <clears throat> other investigators uh, to accelerate the development of natural nanomedicine for food allergy. Here, I want to thank uh, my uh, research mentor, Dr. Hugh Sampson, and uh, my colleague, uh, Kamal Nye, and uh, many other co-workers uh, and uh, collaborators, uh, and uh, I and uh, the society um, supporters <laughs> um, the, and uh, the past, the current team members, allergists, dermatologists, as well as the study subjects, patients, and uh, families. And uh, finally, I want to thank my funding agencies from NIH, private organizations, and uh, many families. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Shimin. Um, I'd like to ask you before we move on to speak a little about your SBIR, that process, lessons learned. It's a difficult process and you've obviously been successful in garnering some really interesting support. Can you discuss that process? Oh, thank you. So the SBIR is a small business, uh, um, innovative research. Uh, um, funded uh, by NIH with the goal to support a startup a company to carry on the laboratory interventions uh, to, to accelerate your interventions to the real world. Um, the, they, 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 um, you know, as a scientist, uh, most of the time you are very focused on the interventions. It has been very challenging how to translate your the development to the real world. I think NIH, uh, this uh, innovative uh, small business grant has been very instrumental to accelerate uh, this pro process. I feel that uh, now NIH and uh, local organizations as uh, you know, the Westchester Biotech uh, program, uh, you are uh, running provide a good uh, uh, platform uh, for this uh, effort. The challenge is that, you know, um, the translation from uh, uh, bunch of work to the real world, particularly the innovative, very novel, you know, uh, outstanding discovery that has a very long distance uh, to translate to the real world. I think most of the step is production, right? You have this product in a very small scale. That's wonderful. How can you make uh, to the clinical use level? We need a good uh, resource 
um, and uh, 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 you know substantial support to be able to reach that level. But I am uh, very happy that uh, there is an opportunity to help uh, scientists uh, uh, to develop uh, this. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 this uh, pathway. And uh, then I have to say that uh, um, the many institutions uh, ha have been very, very supportive uh, to cooperate with uh, NIH funding uh, opportunity to support their facu faculty members to provide the resources as a collaboration between the faculty run the small business company and the faculty position in the university to collaborate to fully use the resource to develop the intervention. And I just, uh, I have one more question and then I'll ask Keith if you have any comments or questions. Again, talking about putting together that tender translation, I appreciate that term. And to, um, to, when you talk about the various partners that you're working with, so clearly you're the, the lead scientist, who else is on your team, whether they're, you know, full-time, part-time, but I imagine you have a a, a small constellation of experts <laughs> yeah, that are helping. A small, yes, we do have a, a full-time uh, scientist who have been working, who have been working with me at the institution, um, you know, uh, uh, level, and then they are the key players uh, to uh, exact to to perform the research uh, at uh, the mm -hmm. small. Uh, Business uh, Institute, and then you we do have other support and uh, you know um, uh, the uh, friends, <laughs> uh, colleagues. Uh, they also provide uh, the um, uh, the consultation uh, to how to because and also uh, someone already had already have. Uh, a small business grant. They they are faculty members. They also provide a very very you know uh, generous uh, um, ideas uh, support for the starters like us <laughs> uh, to be able to uh, move forward. All right, I I I, I was kidding. I just have one more. Okay. Lugia, from the from the moment you said, I think I have something here. To today, when when did that moment happen? How many years ago was that? I, I yeah, we I, I think it might be for this latest development will be three or four, five years, um, and then for the very early on, that's over ten years. It is a very long process. <laughs> Can quote, we, we can quote you on that, right? It is a yeah. very long process, right? Thank you very much, Shuman. Uh, uh, Keith, would you like to make any comments, ask any questions? Yeah, thanks very much for your presentation. It was Thank very you. enjoyable to listen to it and you covered the topic very well. Um, I have too many questions to ask you uh, and they're kind of science driven. So maybe not something we can go into very deeply here. Uh, but uh, um, I guess, and I'll also mention that, you know, if you'd like to just have kind of an introductory call with Ilse and our team here, we have a, a program called Biotech Launchpad, and we might be able to give you some additional feedback on how to uh, uh, develop at the early stages of a company. Uh, usually we work with companies trying to get an SBR grant, but I think we've got a uh, deeper perspective than that. But I guess to keep it really short with regard to the questions, I'm wondering what is your ultimate product goal here? Is it the berberine or is it the, the microorganisms that you think could be mechanistically related? And what is the mechanism that you think that connects all of these parties together? And you're dealing with the um, allergic response. Uh, but is it the microbiome constitution that's determining allergic sensitivity or what do you see? I guess my main question is what is your end game product here is to use your mouse model as a platform to really understand uh, what microbiome products might result 
as a therapeutic or a preventative or what, what is your goal from a product point of view, both the composition as well as the application? That's an excellent question. Basically, it's helped me to design <laughs> the next step, right? So I think at this moment, we did see this nanomedicine with this key compound that uh, <clears throat> uh, induce the beneficial bacteria profile and uh, then reduce uh, that we believe that uh, harmful uh, bacteria that are associated with the pathology of food allergy. So moving forward, that will be two ends. One, we go with nanomedicine, uh, natural nanomedicine, and uh, move forward with the FDA's uh, phase one and two to develop a product. Uh, second, is that uh, the deeper study with my colleagues here, uh, we actually start to understand uh, for better which particular strain, uh, species might be very important, will conduct a functional analysis. In the end, maybe we will have a bacterial therapy regardless of nanomedicine and then this end of composition may not be one. I think it should be the consortium, you know, several of yeah. them together at a different level. And then we will be able to identify the universal or at least the general beneficial effect, not only peanut, maybe milk, wheat, you know, other food allergy. So that will be more beneficial because you know, you do you regardless uh, your initial intervention. So we have uh, in the products that might be it, uh, bacteria therapy. Yeah, some of this is a question around cause and effect, um, uh, and also um, I guess is, are there other animal models uh, for food allergy response that you could also test your nano your nano medicine in. It would be interesting to see if there are any correlations in the microbiome response. Uh, um, model. Other model food allergy, we have a tree nut, we have a fish, we have an egg. Um, then we recently also <laughs> generate a model with many families to support. We generate a food allergy allergen together with the environmental allergy induced the uh, esophagus, yes, in a philic, uh, um, esophagitis model. I think uh, this model will be a very good opportunity to to <clears throat> to allow us, allow us to see whether what we found is just a peanut allergy specific or what has a broad application. Thank you. Yeah, I'll stop there, but uh, I have a few more dozen to ask you, maybe some other time. Thank you. For your <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, so uh, we have a couple of uh, discussants um, who will uh, share themselves and they'll kind of model for you what we hope you'll do when it's your turn to introduce yourself. Um, I see a note from you, Richard, that the second Richard is actually Adela. Adela, would you like to put your camera on and say hello and make comments or questions? One second. Um... I, I actually miss a part of your uh, presentation because I, I was uh, busy in, in another call and you know how calls run forever. <laughs> oh, yeah. but, um, my fascination about um, this um, like um, food allergy is related with, um, with the artists. I feel like artists and food allergies, they work hand in hand. And I'm curious about the innate immunity of the gut. I'm thinking about IgA um, in particular. Do you have any like idea about, cause I feel like if IgA is low, food allergies are like Christmas for them. Because, that, you know, yeah. That's a very good question. And then um, uh, we, we have not particularly look at uh, this set uh, of research, but in our <clears throat> other uh, research, other people's research and uh, our other research, we did find uh, upregulation IGA is beneficial and the reduced IGA is uh, a problem for food allergy. Uh, other people have a publication tightly 
link IgA production, particularly in the gut associated lymphoid tissue, right? Perspatch, mesenteric lymph node. Um, this is the key to induce uh, tolerogenic immune response. I really like your idea about uh, the innate immunity. We, we have an, uh, another study. It's really focused on to understand uh, the gut and the brain connections, uh, whether the microbiome play an uh, important role, we do see some connections uh, and uh, innate immune pathway like uh, mTOR PI3 kinase. So we actually submitted a publication in this um, <clears throat> uh, results. Yeah, I have a little bit of experience with the involvement of innate immunity in this connection. Uh, it's uh, in the Morina hippocampus and for the pain involvement. But uh, I always am fascinated about the gut because I feel like gut is like a forest. Those uh, molecules, uh, the mucosa, a healthy mucosa will, will uh, promote a, a hosting of like IgA sitting there and gonna be happy and any like I feel like if you have the healthy healthy gut has been this mucosa should be intact. You are right the <clears throat> the microbiome in addition to the immunological connections uh, additional beneficial effect is to maintain the gut uh, healthy barrier right. Thank yeah, you Fascinated this, this uh, it's an excellent, um, you know, yeah. uh, thanks for your presentation and uh, Thank you. thanks for your interest because there is lots of need over there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Adela. Sure. Uh, Richard Theron, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, um, it's been a great presentation, Zoom in. I uh, enjoyed learning about uh, the microbiome and, you know, food allergies. Uh, Keith and Dell are hard acts to follow, you know, on this question. But I would ask you some more general questions. Uh, what would you, what would you see as some of the challenges in you know, a regulatory for CMC, you know, for you know, deciding your endpoints as you go into phase one and phase two? And what do you envision as, uh, uh, as Adele is suggesting, as to uh, what could be developed to modulate, you know, I. IgA to help shut off uh, the uh, immune response. Um, so let's, start, let's give her a chance to answer one question. So absolutely. your first question is? Um, endpoints and strategy. Um, for, for the challenge to get us uh, to, to generate a sufficient CMC data, I think that we will face uh, quite a strong challenge because uh, for now we are only uh, for the production, for the current, for the current uh, intervention, the nanomedicine, right? So later on, we will uh, progress uh, to understand better which microbiome induced uh, by this nanomedicine strongly associated with the uh, food uh, tolerance. So we may uh, have a, a secondary discovery intervention regardless the nanomedicine, we can develop a, a microbiome therapy through that uh, composition to induce uh, food uh, tolerance. It might be a more general therapeutic uh, approach. For the CMC, for now, we focus on the nanomedicine. I, uh, the most the important thing is uh, the resource. <laughs> we need to make a sufficient uh, production, at least, uh, you know, um, 2030 patients for several months uh, so production. That will allow us to do a phase one study. study. If we generate uh, excellent, you know, results, uh, then you need uh, the next phase uh, of a scale up of uh, production. Um, so I think that uh, the major part uh, we will need uh, a good uh, collaboration for the microbiome uh, uh, moving forward study that I see it. There is a strong collaboration in this uh, group. Uh, I, I, I will be very happy to further, you know, explore the possibility of collaboration. Excellent. 
That's great. And I'll let you ask your second question in a moment, Richard. I just want to mention that we have a program in the works on sustainability and process engineering and really thinking in those scale up phases of the different decisions you can make that will have a huge impact in, in years to come. So oh, I'm, wow. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up, Shumit, and we'll you. certainly want you to participate in that. Go ahead, Richard, with your next question, and then we'll move on to everybody else. Well, a quick announcement. Um, also joining us today you know, are some uh, students from St. Cloud University's uh, regulatory affairs you know, and clinical you know, affairs programs. Um, since you, uh, Westchester is involved in career consortiums, you'll be seeing more of our associate consultants from Cernios, and they'll be primed to ask you know, more questions. Uh, with regard to you know, um, endpoints to you know, phase one, you and phase two, what do you see are some of the regulatory challenges, you know, that you could face with, uh, you know, with the FDA, National Health Service, Health Canada, or other health authorities? From a regulatory uh, <clears throat> issue, my vision is still focusing on the production. So, because at a small scale, we do see consistent, um, excellent effect. Uh, whether we can keep this effect, we don't want to get lost, right? When you start to scale up your production. So, I think the CMC uh, part is still a major challenge. Do you mean in terms of characterization, you know, and uh your process controls as you know, CMC. We do, um, we accumulated some experience uh, on the product uh, quality control. Um, my, my concern is uh, that uh, when we scale up the production and uh, whether we can keep the resource for um, uh, generation of uh, sufficient uh, CMC data. Uh, I will not uh, worry about uh, the safety and the efficacy. Uh, it's uh, really the matter if we can uh, scale up the production at uh, the reasonable time frame, right? So it sounds like you're finding you know, the right you know, CMC you know, and uh, CDMO, you know, CMO uh, collaborator, you know, that can you know, help maintain consistency, you know, of the product, you know, can, um, you can communicate effectively with agencies on what the process has been, you know, and find the right uh, CMO partner, you know, to get the, the correct scale up. Are those, you know, the issues you hope to, um, to deal with in the, uh, in the near future? Yeah, I'm very interested in this uh, support, yeah, and the uh, collaboration. Well, within this group, there's a lot of talent. I'm sure that we uh, can all help with that effort, and we look forward to uh, supporting your efforts. Thank you very much. I'm very happy. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Okay. Thank you, everyone. This has been fantastic. We'll see you next month, and everybody stay safe. Take care. <laughs>